Great. Good afternoon again. And as I mentioned, we are here to mark uh, the International Mine Awareness Day. And we are delighted to welcome back Agnès Marcayou, the director of the UN Mine Action Service. And she is joined by Fatima Chiari, the permanent observer of the African Union to the United Nations, and Ambassador Mona Joule, the permanent representative of Norway to these United Nations. So welcome to the one L, as we say. <laughs> and yes, all yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to, to, to see you every year. It's, a, it's an important day um, uh, for our partnership with the, with the members of the, of the media because um, by now everybody understands that nothing can really be done in a zone that is contaminated by landmines, explosive hazards, or improvised explosive devices. I put in front of me an illustration of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the SDGs have an integral component in, in them, and it is called mine action in all its aspects. Uh, so it is um, uh, really important for us to continue uh, to take up the challenge, which is a challenge still, sadly, that mine action shall not be an afterthought, a second thought. When you plan, program, when you look at a conflict, you cannot leave aside the presence of unexploded ordnance, of uh, the legacies of the conflict, of uh, the uh, weapons of terrorism these days, improvised explosive devices. So this is really why mine action continues to be so important. It's at the core of the peace and security humanitarian development nexus. Every agency of the United Nations uh, has endorsed a United Nations strategy 2019-2023 that puts the system together in a nice way, uh, productive way, in a measurable way to move forward the uh, SDGs and related issues. It's an important day because uh, we are launching Safe Ground. Uh, there is a reception at 6 p.m. today uh, in the visitors' lobby of the Secretariat where we will launch this five-year campaign. It is not an unmasked campaign. It is a United Nations campaign for five years that is aimed at raising the awareness of the community on all aspects of mine actions. But it's uh, most importantly um, to put also the focus on uh, an issue which, in our view, is a little bit left aside, and this is the assistance to survivors. Uh, I just came from a, a, a long panel with, with UN VIPs where it was seen as irrefutable that 69 million people in the world are displaced and, and, and refugees and otherwise, and they, they have this deep desire to go home. Now, they have a first deep desire, which is that in all their displacements, when they flee danger and, and protect themselves from um, the, the, the strikes of all kinds, um, they need to move safely, and they don't. And then they, want, they are settled in camps that need to be established on safe grounds, and ultimately, in the best-case scenario, they will be able to come back home and these homes have to be safe. So Safe Ground, Safe Home is a major campaign that will be uh, supported by uh, a number of uh, uh, partners to the United Nations. And uh, this is what we are uh, launching uh, today. So again, here, uh, we are really compressing the situation in the world where uh, the number of uh, victims and casualties uh, we thought was uh, on a downward trend, and actually it's going up again. Uh, explosive remnants of wars, improvised explosive devices continue to be uh, 
uh, a threat that needs to be mitigated. And the United Nations is making a great deal of progress, actually, in understanding better the threat, in getting together to respond to it in a comprehensive manner. And for that, I, uh, I relate to, to the Secretary General's disarmament agenda, saving lives. Um, I will be open for questions. I would like to uh, leave um, some room to, to my co-panelists here to present their different perspectives. Thank you. Ambassador Kerry. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, or is it morning? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and allow me, on behalf of the African Union, to start by thanking uh, Madame uh, Agnes Marcayou and her team for the kind uh, invitation to attend this uh, attend this briefing. And uh, just to mention that this uh, important day is also recognized um, uh, at the African Union in Addis today, the Peace and Security Council also um, commemorated it and it ended just a few hours ago. Um, where uh, we are concerned, of course, anti-personal mines um, and improvised uh, explosive devices continue to pose a threat to many of the countries on the continent, and this is of huge concern for the uh, African Union. Um, IEDs in particular um, recently are increasingly being deployed by non-state armed groups and terrorists in various uh, regions, including the Horn of Africa, the Sahel, and um, yeah, it's my voice. Look, there we go. Is this Perfect. better? Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, the Lake Chad Basin, and this has targeted, in, in addition to civilians, um, humanitarian actors, and of course, um, peacekeepers. And um, of course, these uh, daunting challenges, um, there are daunting challenges particularly for our peace support operations and our, and our peacekeepers. And this has caused a number of um, significant deaths um, amongst the troops. Um, and what's even more worrisome is many times we don't necessarily have the um, technical uh, capacity or the necessary training. Um, uh, or the expertise uh, in order to, to address this challenge. Um, these reasons and other related emerging uh, explosive hazards are why the African Union considers mine action as a vi vital part of our peace and security architecture, which contributes, of course, to humanitarian action, peace building, and sustainable development. Um, I'd like to just give you very quickly um, uh, an update on the current state of affairs. Um, as of today, the majority of our member states um, are a party, of, party to the Mine Ban Convention of 1997. Um, at the time of accession the convent, of the convention, there were 25 states that had um, declared areas under their jurisdiction in which anti-personal mines were known or suspected to be um, emplaced. Um, currently, um, all states that have declared stockpiles of anti-personal landmines have since uh, destroyed them. Thereby, redu thereby reducing the, um, the risks um, for death and, uh, and disability. Um, but where clearance is concerned, um, we still have uh, about uh, 12 states that are still, um, still uh, uh, working on, on clearance. But most recently, uh, we have um, Algeria in 2016 and Mozambique in 2017 that have, uh, that have um, joined, joined uh, this list. Um, in addition, as you know, this is of um, utmost concern for us because out of the 179 life-saving mine action projects, 22 African countries are part of this, are part of this list. And um, there are a number of initiatives that have been undertaken by the African Union and, and partners to provide advocacy, technical and operational assistance to member states, as well as technical and operational assistance to peace support operations, including um, uh, donations of equipment, uh, et cetera. More specifically, what the African Union um, Commission is doing, um, in 2014, we launched the Mine Action and Explosive Remnants of War Strategic uh, Framework Project. And this was um, to basically support our AU member states in reducing the threat posed by uh, conventional weapons, mines, explosive remnants of war, cluster munitions, and IEDs. And um, this is in, in accordance with the relevant international instruments and best practices. 
the framework itself recognizes um, that national governments are the primary owners for developing and implementing the mine action and explosive management programs in spite of the um, substantial regional and international support and assistance that is uh, required. Within this framework, um, the AU has more recently adopted a number of initiatives aimed at delivering concrete technical and material support to member states. And these include the Inter-African Platform for Mine Action Cooperation and the Ammunition Safety Management uh, Initiative. Um, details of this are available if anybody um, wants additional information. Um, and our contribution has been, you know, first to acknowledge uh, that um, a standalone, a standalone resolution on mine action uh, was adopted by the United, United. Sorry, I'll, I'll take that again. Um, our contribution to mine action has been acknowledged in the first standalone resolution on mine action adopted by the United Nations Security Council in June 2017. And in addition to that, we've always urged member states to renew their commitment uh, to mine clearance and victims assistant, uh, assistance. We also do recognize that the 2025 Maputo commitment cannot be realized without dedicating the required resources in assuming full ownership of national mine action programs. And we must also intensify our efforts to address the emerging explosive threats which manifest in uh, improvised explosive and un un unstable ammunition stockpiles. And in this regard, we call on the uh, UN. First, uh, we acknowledge the support that we, we've received, um, but we also um, call on the UN and other international partners to remain engaged. Um, while we continue to also um, support uh, our member states in addressing this this issue. Um, moving forward, we have another, a number of initiatives, but maybe I'll just stop here and um, uh, for the details, like I said, they're, um, they're available if, if you'd like further information. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Mona? Yeah, um, I would also like to start with thanking uh, Agnes and Stefan for in, in, inviting uh, us, uh, Norway, to this uh, noon briefing today on a on a very very important uh, topic and to uh, to mark the Mine Awareness Day. Um, I think I just will start with uh, with stating a, a very sad fact, um, and that is that. Mine action is about protecting our civilians from weapons that continue to kill and injure people long after a conflict has ended. Every time a landmine is destroyed, we are potentially saving someone's life or limb. But we need to remember that a mine-free world does not mean a world without landmine victims and survivors. We need the experience and leadership of mine-affected states, and we need what we know might see is sort of being under threat also on this issue, uh, reinforced multilateralism. The mine ban Treaty is perfect, per perhaps the most successful multilateral disarmament treaty of recent time. It was signed in Norway back in 1997 and it came into force uh, two years uh, later. And I think at the time, I think nobody thought that as of now, there would be 163 signatures to this uh, convention. Norway is very proud to hold the presidency, actually once, once again, uh, on the mine ban, ban treaty this year. Uh, as I said, 164 st states support the treaty, three quarters of the member states here at the UN. So we want to use this opportunity to increase attention to our common future on how we can prevent new casualties from mines and explosive reminiscent of war. But our job is by no means done. Um, Norway is known for being a consistent partner and uh, our support to the global mine action goes back more than 25 years. 
Norway is one of the five countries in the world who contributes most to this important work, approximately $38 million each year to clear mines in almost 20 countries. Mine action makes humanitarian relief, peace building and sustainable development possible. So our joint efforts are needed as state parties, as defenders of the norms against landmine use, as donors and as partners. And we also need success stories that can inspire those who face similar challenges. And I would like to, uh, to mention Mozambique as a great example in this case. A heavily contaminated country when the mine ban treaty was adopted. But today, Mozambique has declared herself free of landmines. So, looking forward to welcome all parties uh, um, to the, uh, the fourth review conference uh, of the Mine Ban Treaty in, uh, in Oslo in November. And I also invite all of you to help us and to really take part marking today's Mine Awareness Day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Evelyn? Good to see you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Oh, no, sorry. Evelyn Leopold and I <coughs> welcome you on behalf of the UN Cars <coughs> Correspondents Association. I have a couple of questions. Uh, you said the, there was a downward trend, but now it's going up again. Do you have figures for that? And secondly, your, your main program is to train trainers in various countries and send people out from the UN to train local trainers. Is this getting harder or you, are, you getting, are you getting response or are you short of countries in Africa? Uh, as the AU said, there's still a huge gap. Thank you. And yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, the, the, the figure that comes to my mind is, uh, is, is the figure of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we are right now at an estimated 170 civilian casualties per month, which is a five-fold increase in explosive hazard casualties over the past five years. And at one point, we, we were optimistic that the number of victims in of survivors victims in in, uh, in afghanistan was below 100 a year but now we are at, at 170 a month so that's illustrative of the of, of the, the the upward trend that we we are thinking um, why so uh, it's a combination of factors as usual uh, when you're looking at the conflicts in the world you have noticed that the duration uh, the intensity, the volume of weaponry that is used has uh, increased. I mean, the, 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 you, we, we, we know that. You report about this. Um, and we also have, uh, uh, in addition to that, the activities of the uh, non-state armed groups, terrorist groups, uh, that have resorted to, um, you know, the weapons of terror, I would say, uh, more than uh, they used to be. So this is where uh, uh, the, the, the APMBC is a success story. Um, uh, it is necessary to implement it fully. It is necessary to continue to uh, call for its universalization, but it is not sufficient. So let's put it this way. With regard to training, uh, are we short of people to train? No, well, we do more than training and mass. Huh? If you if you look at what we do in a, in the context of a peace operation, we um, yes, we advise, we train, we mentor, we advise on equipment. Sometimes we equip, uh, and when it comes to special political missions, we actually carry humanitarian mine action activities, risk education, clearance, and and um, and victim assistance in most of our programs. Um, trainer, finding people to train, no. Uh, no, but you realize that every time we put in place a training program, it's got to be funded 
somewhere. So we need to hire the trainers. We need to develop the training modular. This is not a one-size-fits-all. It has to be specifically uh, adjusted to the terrain where the people will be deployed, to the specific task, to the specific profile that will be needed. So we need to develop that. We need the trainers. And, and then we will find the trainees. Uh, funding uh, is, is really uh, le nerf de la guerre, the, the key to that. Thank you. Nabil and then Errol. Ali Varada from uh, France 24 and I shall close that newspaper. Uh, good to see uh, women talking about mine action while the mines are deployed by, mostly by men. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, the root cause of, uh, uh, of this problem is the production. I wonder whether you agree and whether you um, have been doing work with the countries that uh, produces the, uh, produce the mines around the world. Where, do you have any uh, numbers uh, to give us? Thank you. I can assure you that uh, that that is part of the problem that uh, landmines are continued to be produced and 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 that uh, that uh, we as 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 Norway but certainly this is again needs a multilateral <laughs> effort uh, to try to look into that as well uh, but I I don't I, I can't give you any 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 exact numbers uh, on uh, on this unless uh, Agnes would uh, uh, would have some, but I, I, I would like uh, to add to the uh, to, to the previous question that there is, of course, uh, <clears throat> obviously one of the reasons also that we see an increase in in uh, in, in landmine both being used and 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 uh, people being killed and uh, and injured is that there is an increase of, of non-state actors using uh, landmines in, in 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 conflict and of course they don't see themselves as uh, abided to the uh, uh, to the convention so that is a challenge that we certainly need to look into Errol uh, thank you very much indeed for this briefing um, Probably it's to start with you, Madam Ambassador, since I know that your my name is Errol Avdevich with Public Applies New York. Uh, I know your country is very much involved in Europe also, not only in uh, uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, as our thoughts by inertia goes when it comes with uh, terrible problems, but in Bosnia as well, there are mm -hmm. hundreds of thousand mines left. Mm -hmm. I want you if, you, if you can, to share a little bit how you measure the success, and for you also, Madam Anis, uh, how you measure the success, do you work with the governments and do you work with the diplomatic mission here at the Bosnia? I would like to say that on the record, probably, how you cooperate with them in order mm. to solve. There are many casualties, obviously, in the heart of Europe. Mm. No, of course. I mean, this is this is uh, this is uh, a, a multilateral uh, effort, and we w we work uh, bilaterally with uh, w with states. But we need we need to work to, to together on this. And uh, and there are certainly countries where where uh, where we think uh, that uh, that our I mean, it's 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 quite a target uh, to reach to be declared mind free because i mean there are many many countries still that uh, that have the problem and 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 through the help of of, of experts all this is being monitored uh, very well i think uh, so so what we are mainly working on is of course the the uh, the, the, the the norms and the and and, and the and, and the need to, to have on, on, on government uh, level uh, a 100% a ban and 100% uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, wanting to make sure that, that, that these are not being used, at least uh, not among state, uh, no, state actors, uh, while, as I said, it's more difficult with others. I, I, Satisfied with corporations of the government, uh, in, in, in particular, for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't. Uh, I can't. Um, 
comment on, on, on specific countries in, in this, certainly not. And yes? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes. Well, thank you for also mentioning Europe, because it shows that, uh, as the ambassador said, uh, the, the, the problem does not stop when, uh, when the war stops, when the conflict stops. Uh, with regard to uh, countries like uh, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, yes, they are measuring uh, mechanisms in place. Um, in, in these countries, you have mine action authorities that are governmental authorities which have uh, been created uh, at the time when, when the emergency appeared to tackle this issue. Uh, the maps, the contamination maps are there. The uh, mapping of the casualties and uh, are also all of that is recorded. With regard to um, uh, Europe, I would say you have a number of players on the ground in Europe uh, dealing with this. The EU is, is the major player and, uh, and I would say the, the major world donor in, uh, in mine action globally. Um, uh, countries support bilaterally, not only with funding, but also with expertise, with equipment. Although I, I must say countries like Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia would have more to teach us than, uh, than to be taught, uh, you know, after so many years of facing contamination. Funding uh, is always needed. It's an expensive activity. This is not, uh, you're not deploying people with a pen and a notepad. You, you're deploying, uh, you know, a certain set of expertise and skills with a certain set of machinery. And this is just for clearance. But again, I come back here to uh, the, the other issue, which is assistance to survivors. And this is where uh, the world has completely forgotten that issue. 2018 was the largest uh, funding envelope for mine action, and I can come back to you uh, with, with figures on this, but what I have remembered is that only 2% of that huge envelope was actually allocated to uh, victim rights and survivors' assistance. And this is what the United Nations uh, uh, led, coordinated by UNMAS, has embarked on. It is really to make sure that this topic is equally uh, is, is considered as important as the problem of clearance. So this is uh, what I can contribute. Thank you. Ibtisam and then um, Mr. Sato. Hi, my name is Ibtisam Azim from, uh, hi, how are you? Good, welcome back. <laughs> uh, good to see you. My name is Ibtisam Azim from Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. Uh, my question is about the subject of uh, assistant to survivor. Could you tell us what do you have now? Which kind of programs you have? And what's your aim? Where do you want to get? And whether these assistant to survivors also has a mental health assessment? Thank you. Um, in most of UNMAS programs, if I can speak for UNMAS, we have uh, projects, programs, uh, initiatives related to assistance uh, to victims. But leaving on mass aside, what we need to remember is that there is a United Nations policy on victim assistance. So what we have led is uh, the, the, the syst uh, a comprehensive approach by the whole of UN uh, deployed in most countries in the world to make sure that we understand victim assistance the same way and that the activities we carry out are the right type of activities that we can measure the impact and that we, they are not duplicated. So we have this UN policy on victim assistance that is also strengthened now by, by this uh, newly adopted United Nations strategy for mine action 2019-2023. There is a strategic objective that is dedicated to assistance to victims. Uh, the primary responsibility is with member states. So what, what the United Nations does ultimately is uh, support, assist, advise, uh, and in cases implement, but usually we, we use implementing partners to do that. Uh, the countries have to be sensitized to the fact that uh, this is a lost generation that they are facing at a time when the country needs to be rebuilt, reconstructed, and when resilience becomes the name of the game. Um, I thank you for asking a question about mental health. Uh, not only is assistance to survivors something that is forgotten, but for those who remember, they will immediately think of 
for stay six okay. and, and, and wheelchairs. And that's good, and we need that. I mean, in the life of a kid who got injured, you have to factor in, just like when your kids need new shoes, uh, in, in the lifetime of a kid, we will need 25 new prosthetics as the kid grows up to reach its adult size. But the mental health issue is something that is tremendous. You have people who will be traumatized to the core after living for eight years um, uh, under tremendous strikes and fear and displacements and, and, and seeing their families being slaughtered in front of their eyes. You have men, women, girls, and boys uh, in, in camps who must be waking up with nightmares at night, reliving this. And when you look at the next generation, you have kids who will not have gone to school before age 11, 12, when it's too late for them to learn properly anyway. And in a country or in a place like New York, where we speak a lot about attention deficit disorders for kids who live in pretty comfortable conditions, you can imagine that if, if when these kids go to school, they will have tremendous learning disabilities. And this is something that we all need to put back on the agenda. It is definitely a, a, a personal and professional crusade for me to put that in the agenda. We need to harness the lessons learned, the good practices from South countries and, and developed countries to understand what works when we render assistance in refugee camps, displaced IDP camps, and, and in the communities where we will entice these people to come back to after they are deemed safe. Mr. Sato, then uh, Maggie. Yeah, then. NHK. I have two questions. One question is about uh, uh, women empowerment uh, among the uh, demining staff uh, of the AMAS. Can you tell us uh, advancement? And the one more question is about specifically uh, how is the situation in the demining uh, activity in South Sudan? Thank you. Please. Uh, yes. The, the all women, all women demining team, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's symbolic. It's a great achievement. Uh, it means that we are coming a long way. The mine action community uh, seems to be making some progress uh, with, uh, with um, an, an, I would say, more women. Uh, considering that uh, gender in mine action is not just how many women deminers we have. We want to have women heads of programs. We want to have women sitting at the head of the national authority of a government. And we want women at the peace talks, at the peace table, to talk about mine action. They need to, re to rebuild also. So uh, the Bamiyan women deminers, it's great. Uh, the gender parity strategy of the Secretary General must be implemented at all levels in peace operations. A4P, you know that it's a, it's a top priority in our uh, world, or at least with, with regard to en masse, um, whether it's en masse per se or our implementing partner uh, UNOPS, we are uh, implementing with a, a good deal of uh, good results, I would say, the integration of women and raising the statistics. But again, we will have done our job when the specific needs and requirements of men and women, boys and girls, are taken into account. That's what gender is about. Primary victims of uh, explosive hazards, men and boys for landmines. So your programs have to be tailored to them. Uh, when you're looking at kids, and you design a program for victim assistance, you need to factor in 25 prosthetics for a kid. Uh, this is how you take into account the specific needs and requirements of a specific gender and a specific age. So diversity is important, uh, and uh, uh, the Bamiyan, uh, the old women deminers, is, is definitely something that needs to be appreciated. Um, South Sudan, well, South Sudan, we need to put that back into uh, the context of, uh, of South Sudan. Uh, UNMAS is an integral component of uh, UNMIS. Uh, we are developing uh, a small side of more humanitarian uh, mine action activities. Uh, 
uh, Japan has been uh, a great supporter of the work that we have done in South Sudan, and uh, I get a pretty solid confidence that it will uh, continue. Uh, we are uh, clearing, we are surveying, assessing, and clearing parts of the countries where we have access. But you know that the political and the violent situation is very fluid. So um, uh, sometimes we, we get the feeling that it's a little bit like Sisyphus when uh, you, you keep pushing the rock up the hill uh, because you have cleared the place and, and the lines of conflicts are moving and you need to do it again. But what we do is uh, tremendous in, in, in supporting the mission when you just think, as an example, the, the survey and the clearance of landing pads or opening the way for the peacekeepers to and enhancing their mobility, which is really what the UN is about in, a, in one of these countries. All right, Margaret, and then we'll take one last question on the front row. Thank you. Uh, Margaret Bashir with the Voice of America. Uh, Madame Marcayo, uh, Syria and Yemen, even though those conflicts are still ongoing, I imagine you have some access uh, in those countries. Can you give us an idea of the scope of the mine problem in Syria and Yemen and how many years you think it will take to uh, remediate the mines there? Thank you. Uh, many, many years. Um, uh, when it, you, you have mentioned access, and this is, uh, I think, the, 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 first, uh, the first key to the problem. We will be able to have a proper assessment of the situation when access uh, is, is, given, uh, is given, and when the proper surveys, proper assessments can be done. What we can rely on, with your help, the media, is uh, in monitoring the airstrikes and monitoring the intensity of the conflict through open sources of information. And that gives us a, a sense, a uh, rule of thumb, of the level of contamination that we're going to face in certain areas and certain uh, regions. So this is uh, the kind of mapping that uh, ANMAS is, uh, is leading most of the time, but we are doing very closely with the Office of Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, because this information is for the humanitarian community, for the planning, the programming, and the deployment, the safe deployment of humanitarian uh, assistance. Um, Yemen, uh, you, you have two parts in Yemen that I can speak in, in, about in general terms. You have uh, the clearance part that is referred to in the Stockholm Agreement. Uh, so implementation of the Stockholm Agreement, uh, if, if, I'm, uh, if I'm still up to date, uh, that part was really the responsibilities of the parties uh, to, to clear and, and to take out what they had put in. Uh, now, with the, uh, with the um, improvement, hopefully, of the political <laughs> situation and, and, and the talks, we, we, we see our UN colleagues uh, looking at ways to open the way for humanitarian assistance and for the mobility, for the, for the sheer mobility of the UN and, of course, the safety of the populations. Uh, in Yemen, uh, UNMAS and UNDP are working closely. You have a YEMAC, a Yemeni Mine Action Center, that has been operating in Yemen for a number of years. Uh, all these efforts need to, to come to play under proper coordination uh, in due course sooner rather than later, I hope. Thank you. Okay. See, I'll get you two seconds, just maybe have a quick follow-up on Syria, and then I'll... Agency Maria Hrenova, just uh, uh, Russia is doing some demining activities in Syria as well, and they uh, said several times that they are trying to cooperate more with UN on that. Do you have any cooperation with Russia on that now? Absolutely. Um, well, the cooperation started uh, some time ago when uh, the Russian Federation um, helped uh, the UN make the case that mine action was, was important in Syria, humanitarian mine action. So this is where uh, political support was uh, important uh, because of their links to the uh, Syrian government, and that has come to um, uh, fruition. Uh, as you know, since last July, we have uh, signed a cooperation agreement with uh, the government of Syria, and it's being implemented, um, you know, at, in, at, at its own pace, but without any uh, obstacle uh, 
that um, uh, that that uh, you know could have been expected. Um, Russia is operating in Syria. You have bilateral demining operations, and then you have a humanitarian mine action operation that uh, UNMAS has been entrusted with. Um, by the government of Syria. A number of countries are interested in providing demining organizations, which will be needed. Uh, the, the volume and the complexity of the contamination is, is uh, humongous, and uh, we will need as many partners as we can. Uh, these partners will be uh, the responsibility first of the government of Syria, and then we will, en masse, will work on uh, on the coordination of these activities uh, st as a standard way. Um, the other point is uh, building um, a civilian Syrian humanitarian mine action capacity. Uh, this is a part of the of our program in Syria that we are working on. We we uh, established our office quite recently. It was the end of October, and uh, this is proceeding um, pretty well as we speak, so this is it. And to finish, because you're reporting to Russia, um, the uh, Russian government has, uh, Russian Federation has informed us that uh, the Russian Federation is considering uh, contributing a $1 million uh, uh, yeah, uh, financial contribution to UNMAS for, for Syria. Uh, it is a very important token of engagement. Uh, because it shows that the partnership is real, and we're going to be uh, working together with them like we work together with other donor countries, also supporting our operations in Syria. Thank you. Last question. Uh, CFAC from Scan News Norway. Um, my question is for any of you ladies. Usually companies are surviving because they are making money, end of the year. Um, Sandy Hook tra tragedy a couple of years back here in the U.S. Now the vic parents' victims are uh, get permission to sue the gun factories. So what is stopping you people on the other side of the aisle to get united and go after the manufacturers, those who make guns, those who make mines, those who make weapons, and then get them to pay for the damages they cause? So what is stopping you guys to get a couple of lawyers and go after them? Uh, I have a very simple answer. We guys are the United Nations. We are an intergovernmental organization, and we do not sue private industry. But I will, uh, I will defer to <laughs> others. Yeah, same with the African Union, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.